Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. This episode of the Plant-Based Podcast is brought to you by our friends at Cobra. The Cobra range of garden machinery is constantly expanding and offers the UK's largest range of lawnmowers. With a comprehensive lineup of quality and innovative petrol, electric, battery and cordless products to tackle any gardening task, Cobra is the newest evolution in garden machinery. Visit cobragarden.co.uk for your chance to win a variety of great Cobra products. So today's podcast episode, we have a really fabulous guest for you. It's Lovely Greens. You will know Lovely Greens, I'm absolutely sure, from uh, an amazing Instagram account and really thriving YouTube account as well. Um, Tanya is an organic gardener and makes loads of really cool, like medicinal, cosmetic, toiletry type stuff from plants. And um, I've been an avid follower of Tanya for years. Is, and he's also got a new book out, which I'm really excited to read as well. So welcome to the podcast. We're really pleased to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I've been enjoying thinking about having this conversation and uh, having a chat because it's been literally, literally like years that we've been following each other yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and having conversations face to face, even if it's over Zoom, is just so much different to chatting online. It is, isn't it? Like, I think you make a better connection. Like, even though we're not in person, you just feel like you're connecting with the person better. And I think we have met, but maybe only for about three or four minutes. I saw you flitting around the uh, garden press event last year. Uh Yes. It's really important. I I think I said hello. (laughs) Cool. Do you know the funny thing is everybody does say, I saw you, Michael, briefly at the garden press event, <laughs> but like you were hurrying, scurrying around. Oh, it's yes. like no one there, like come <laughs> over and say, Michael. Oh, like, stop and that, no. hey, it was it was just it. all about business. He was just going from person to person to person <laughs> like a social butterfly. <laughs> You've got um, red cheeks. You've got you, just, all you just get this thing. You know you've got to get around a lot of things in the day. And, yeah, <laughs> so, so you tend to have those little clipped conversations with each person. And Yeah, yeah especially at an event like that. So yeah, many definitely. people. So, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about you today. It is all about you today. I can't wait to delve into a little bit more about what you do. Definitely. So... I've already obviously introduced you as Lovely Greens and said your name, Tanya, but tell us a little bit more about you because I think overall most people do know, do know you as Lovely Greens, you know? Mm. And yes. we, we're often like online, we're referred to as our like uh, Insta tag, yeah, aren't we, yeah. rather than our actual name. But anyway, tell us a little bit about you, what you do, like your, you know, your garden and everything. Let's give us some background. I am obviously originally American, and Mm -hmm. I moved away from the States. I'm from Washington State, so on the other coast from where you were. And I moved away about 20 years ago. And my background is not gardening. I grew up with a gardening and a farming family, but it was something that I didn't really have any interest for initially. And so I got into design and art initially and I worked as a graphic designer and ended up somehow in the mobile phone industry. So I moved to Germany. I lived there and I worked um, designing interfaces and I moved to London where I did the same thing. And then something happened you know in my late twenties and I really just wanted a change and somehow came across gardening again. And it really got me I guess, looking forward to the weekend, I started 
teaching myself, remembering from when I was a child, because we always had vegetable gardens, we always had, always had flowers, mm-hmm. and experimenting with things that I could make with plants too, not just food, but other things like lip balm, simple things. Mm-hmm. And I got so excited about this and had the opportunity to move outside of London and to start something fresh and new and Mm -hmm. really wanted to be someplace rural, ended up here on the Isle of Man. Most people don't don't even know that this place exists, but it's wonderful. (laughs) It's so funny because I was sitting on the sofa on a Friday night waiting for Gardener's World to come on. And there was an advert for Visit the Isle of Man, a tourism campaign. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, wow, that looks like an amazing place. And uh, yeah, I still remember it vividly. And so that was kind of the thing that brought it up onto the plate and then ended up moving here. And then funnily enough, I was in the Visit the Isle of Man campaign some years later. So it kind of came around full circle. (laughs) So this is like basically Gardener's World is to blame for everything. (laughs) Yes, it is. Oh, wow. And then then, you started your botanical journey when you then moved there. Yeah. Well, I, I wasn't working. Mm-hmm. my normal job anymore. So basically I, I signed up for an allotment. I signed up for a beekeeping course and I had time to really delve into my interests. Mm-hmm. And I started a blog, lovelygreens.com. It was actually a blog spot blog at that mm-hmm. time, mainly as a hobby uh, and to connect with other people because I didn't know a soul here on the island when I first moved. Yeah. And Somehow it just started getting a lot more traffic. Some of the ideas I was putting up, especially things like DIY projects for the garden, mm-hmm. uh, were getting traction. And then all of a sudden I, start, I started getting contacted by a lot of people um, about sharing more ideas and how do you do this. And it eventually became my job. So I have my, my website, which is actually my main business. Most people don't realize that, and YouTube. And then I also have a beauty business as well. So I, I make handmade soaps and lip balms and salves and things like that. But uh, it's all very boutique and handmade. So I really have a limit to how much I can make. So it's my side business really these days. But I show people through lovelygreens.com how they can do it themselves as well. Yeah. And it, it isn't difficult. It's like it is that educational aspect. I think that you give you give so much information, and it really pulls people in because people want to learn. Like, and going forward, definitely on socials, it is going to be more about education than anything else. Yeah, you know, a hundred percent. So, you know, what, at what point in your gardening journey did you suddenly go? Oh, actually, these plants are useful plants, and I can, you know, make so much more with them rather than you know just. I say just, but just eat, grow them and eat them. At what point did you decide that you were going to grow specifically, you know, to make amazing toiletries and such like? You know, it's really funny because there was a bit of a eureka moment there of connecting everything that I was doing, making beauty products and the bees, of course, and what was going on in the garden. But it had actually been there for a very long time since I was a child. And I first started becoming interested in gardening. I think I was seven or eight years old when I had my first garden and it was with flowers. And at an early age, I was always reading and I loved novels by Jean All, which people will know as like the Clan of the Cave Bear series. Mm -hmm. And that heroine was, was really big for me. I really looked up to that. But all throughout those novels, they have all of these medicinal plants which I was fascinated with when I was a child and then kind of forgot about. And then when I got back into gardening again, I started remembering things from those novels, which are fictional, but actually a lot of it is real. They are plants that we can use. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I kind of launched into discovering more for myself as well. And there is a wealth of resources out there for anyone to be able to learn from home. And I think over the past year, we, we have realized that even more so being locked in. I love that. I, ever since I was a kid, I've been doing all these weird concoctions. I remember when I was a teenager, I was trying to grind down dandelion roots to make coffee. I remember um, trying to make eucalyptus mouthwash as well once. <laughs> and these experiments, yeah. they weren't usually successful, don't get me wrong, but it was just nice to play with plants in that way. I've That's the word, that. play. I'm fascinated so that everything we could do comes that as a child. Plants. 
Yeah, fantastic. So I'll always have a go at stuff like that. Yeah, it's just fantastic. Yeah. So I love Thank that you just picked plants. up Tanya on the word play. You were like, that's yeah. it. Like, it's play yeah, in the plants. Definitely. But it is. It's been creative. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. But what sort of space do you grow in there? Like, do you grow everything that you use to make your beauty products or do you use some from elsewhere? How does all of that I work? Use, I, I use some from elsewhere, but I grow a lot. But again, I'm a very, I'm just one woman. I can only grow so much. So I, for personal use, I grow all of the different herbs that I use, but for when it comes to making products, it is a mixture of what I can grow, what I can source from uh, local growers and what I can, I can buy in from UK growers. So are you quite like prepared and planned each year of what Mm. you're going to do? Do you sit down and structure everything you're going to do, or do you just go with it and see what happens? It's a mixture. Uh, Mm -hmm. You've got to roll with it when it comes to growing. And sometimes you have a massive amount of plant material, depending on how good the season is. Mm -hmm. And other times you don't, or or sometimes it's just plain impossible to get some things in. And recently there's been a international shipping crisis Mm -hmm. everywhere. It affects even, even shipping within UK and Europe. And so getting things. So for example, I make candles as well. And so my stock of uh, soy wax, I had to wait two months to get it. Oh no. Uh, It's yeah. So you have to roll with it. And as far as growing things, you plan for the best. And then if you aren't able to get what you need, you try to source it from whatever growers you can. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the herbs that you grow, though, because obviously a lot of the remedies come from herbs. Do you need to replenish those plants every few years or do you find that you get, you know, say 10 years of harvest from one plant? Well, it depends if they're perennial or an annual or if they're self-seeders. So chamomile, for example, and calendula self-seed all over the show. And so I. Yeah. (laughs) yeah, so, So I can count on those two regrow on their own and mm. you know other things like thyme and lavender and rosemary they just keep coming back bigger and yeah. better every year that's cool what's the space like that you growing because the photographs obviously on your social media and um where you film you have a beautiful like space full of useful herbs and flowers and fruit and vegetables what you know what's your space like and also what is the climate like where you are as well Mm. I have two growing spaces I'm kind of in between spaces right now it's all very awkward at the moment because we're buying a new property but we have uh, the home garden here which is a relatively small standard back garden size with four raised beds a greenhouse and some other beds and then a patio garden And then I have the allotments as well. And I grow a lot of the different perennial plants there and a lot of the different herbs. And that is the place that really features in in my YouTube videos. And I think it's people are just entranced by this allotment that I'm so fortunate to have a plot at because of the views and how idyllic it looks. And I think people have seen it on Gardener's World when it aired couple mm-hmm. years ago and again last year and it looks a little bit almost like Switzerland yeah <laughs> some aspects with the trees in the background and this mm-hmm. just a, a lake or the sea in the distance but so I have my allotment we are in the process of buying a new house and that has half of an acre of land and that is all laid to grass at the moment wow. so that, that is going to be sure. the big project yeah. for this year are you looking forward to it Yes, I'm looking forward to it. It's really exciting. It's also a little bit daunting as well. I hope to actually get in there and get started a little bit earlier, but it's just taking so long with everything at the moment. Will you still keep your allotment as well, though? Yes, I I help to run it. I help to make sure that it continues. I recruit new people to come in. I, uh, you know, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy being part of that community aspect um, of being part of an allotment. So yeah, I will definitely keep the allotment. And what's the climate like there? It's, well, I guess if you're outside of Britain, you would uh, characterize it as a zone eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's essentially, we have very mild winters, very mild summers. Doesn't get too hot, doesn't get too cold. So I wouldn't say it's quite a Goldilocks 
place to grow <laughs> because there's a lot of things that I can't grow outdoors because it's just not warm enough or there's issues with blight or other things, but, uh-huh. but it's mild enough. Mild enough. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. So in the second half of the podcast, we tend to ask about like remedies that people can make at home a little bit more of kind of like the take homes. But before we end part one, I just want to ask you because you're obviously using YouTube a lot and social media. How do you kind of, how do you blend that with actually doing? Because sometimes you're doing like, do you then have the camera on automatically or how do you kind of um, manage all of that? Because it looks like so much work, but you make it so effortless. It is. It is a lot of work. It is a lot of work. And I I live lovely greens. And so I do often have a camera on to film things, especially if I want to come back to it later in the season. Mm. It's important to have that B-roll footage for when you're making videos. Yeah. And there is a there is a content plan, so I try to stick with it. It's not hundred percent concrete, but I have the year planned out. Yeah, well, this is what I plan on doing. That's that. so good oh, to well, have the whole year planned. The out. The actual growing, but also the videos you'll create as well. Yeah, and the content yeah. for the website and everything. Yeah. That's, oh, that's brilliant. So good. This is putting me <laughs> massively. Like I plan about a week in advance. Yeah, anything. I think we both shoot from the hip with that sort of stuff. Yeah, Ellen, your delivery. I've got someone at the door. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is what working from home is like. <laughs> but this is a good time to close close up part one because in part two we'll be back with a few take homes for you guys at home to make some of Tanya's lovely remedies. So join us in a short time. Hello, it's Donna from Pretty Cactus Plants here. I'm here to talk to you all about houseplants. This time on the Plant Based Podcast, we're going to talk about houseplants and feng shui. It helps with bring some positive energy to your home, which obviously has a good effect on your well-being, and it can relieve stress too. One of the key lessons of feng shui is the intentional selection and placement of things throughout your home and the discouragement of wasteful, unnecessary clutter. When you take time to mindfully organise plants around your home, you're not only inviting positive energy into your space, you're also helping your mental health. The act of bringing nature into your home has been proven to decrease feelings of anxiety, promote a better night's sleep, and even help increase your focus on distractions to the minimal. While you may be the one watering your plants, they're actually taking care of you just as much as you're taking care of them. Feng Shui doesn't label plants as good or bad for the home. It does have guidelines in which types of plants are the most beneficial to keep indoors. If a plant has rounded or soft leaves, they may promote a gentle but positive energy into a space and are therefore recommended most. The quality can be found in plants like a well-groomed jade succulent, a Boston fern when it receives plenty of sunlight, or even a common philodendron Brazil for its soft, contrasting variegation. At the end of the day, Feng Shui principles teach us that all plants can have a positive effect on the home, so choosing the plant that feels right for you is the most important part. If you want to pick out some plants to add a touch of Feng Shui to your home, head on over to www.prettycactus.co.uk. Thanks, until next time, bye! Right, here's part two with Lovely Green. So we're going to ask her now for her advice on anybody that is starting up making their own beauty and health treatments at home. We'll also ask for a few recipes that you guys can start making at home as well. So how how do people start making their own beauty treatments, Tanya? Well, I would say that beauty treatments are can be seen sometimes like food recipes. And when you're starting off, keep it simple. Mm -hmm. see what you have growing that's in season, see what weeds you have growing that might have medicinal benefits or skincare benefits. Definitely. And use what you have at hand. Also, just keep it simple. There are a a lot of the skincare products that we know and use are very complicated, sometimes chemical formulas. And I feel that a lot of it is actually not really necessary. And Mm -hmm. most people don't really understand what's in a beauty product or what the function of each one of the ingredients is. And so first of all, looking at the plants you have, also looking in your cabinet, see what products you use regularly and that you like 
and start to understand what the ingredients are and how you can maybe use some of them in combination with the plants that you're growing. Because there's there's so many um, like toiletries and when you look on the list of ingredients, there's a whole load of stuff that you have no idea what any of it means. And then there's like lavender. Do you know what I mean? Or, um, or I know. Well, I've got something. There's a friend of mine who's a massage therapist and she knows that I like natural products. And so she bought me this. It's a, a product that says developed by osteopaths at Well Street Clinic. And it's all very official. But And I turn around the ingredients and it's all, of course, in I-N-C-I names, so the Latin names. And as gardeners, we'll recognize quite a few of them. But this, which I think was about 20 or 25 pounds, the first ingredient, grapeseed oil. Yeah. The mm-hmm. second ingredient is St. Saint, Saint John's wort, which grows right. really well in our climate. Mm-hmm. And it says exactly how they used it as well it, to make the oil. It says that's a macerate. So that botanical was partially dried or fully dried and then macerated into oil and then after that there's a little bit of essential oil including uh roman chamomile we've got lavender which is they say is lavender but i can read it and i know that it's lavandin there's also rosemary marjoram and then there's a bunch of scientific looking scary words after that (laughs) which are actually just natural components of essential oil so this is something that you could honestly the very beginner novice person interested in making beauty products can make themselves and this is something to help alleviate sore muscles and aches and pains and also inflammation and it would literally cost you less than five pounds to make a lifetime supply basically so that's really interesting because like not not only are you saving money but you are growing something specifically for like your own health, you know? And I think that process is really empowering, you know, to like, I often like Mm -hmm. say to people, you know, if you, I don't know, I always used to use lavender oil on my temples if I was starting to get a headache. And um, this was years ago. I don't get headaches like that anymore. But when I did, I specifically started growing lavender for that purpose. And I found Mm -hmm. that quite empowering. So not only was I gardening, being being outside, but yeah, I was kind of in control Mm -hmm. of it. And I wasn't, you know, having to purchase um, I don't know, things from, you know, the shop that I didn't really even understand mm. what half of the ingredients were anyway. So I think it was like a, almost like a mm. triple benefit. You're outside gardening, um, which is good for you, no matter what. And then you're also feeling empowered because you're growing something specifically for you. Mm. And then you're going through this lovely process of making it and using it without the chemicals. Mm. And so I, like, I just think also like just thinking about perhaps the issues that you have personally and growing like specifically yeah. for that yeah. reason as well but that the empowerment also comes from connection we're growing plants we're using them we're bringing them into our home we are taking things into the garden where we're keeping it as natural and balanced as possible we're creating space for for pollinators all of this it is empowering because it reconnects us to the land yeah mm-hmm. yeah Definitely. Definitely. What well, what do you think would be a great beginner kind of remedy for someone to make at home? What what was the first thing that you made actually? <laughs> lip balms. Ah. Lip balms. Actually, you can't see it here in front of me, but I have so many different things and and actually, so I've got a lip balm here. This is a lip balm that has lemon balm in it. And we all know lemon balm or Melissa balm. Yeah. As a, in the mint family can be a bit invasive. It also has natural antiviral properties which make it great for using in lip balms especially if you get cold sores right and help to alleviate that and it's just so easy um so for example lemon balm for the lip balm but you could also make a chamomile lip balm so you would just Mm -hmm. start by growing your own chamomile so this is german chamomile and you could then infuse it into a carrier oil. So this mm-hmm. is sweet almond oil, which is a very light carrier oil that has lots and lots of purposes in beauty. And then you combine it with, if you want to be vegan, you can go with uh, uh, different vegan plant-based waxes, uh, mm-hmm. rapeseed wax, for example. And there's some more exotic ones or even uh, mango butter for softer uh, consistency. Or you could use beeswax as well. And so when you combine a hard wax with a liquid oil, you get something that's a bit more in between. And that's all a a lip balm is. So it's dead easy. And it is so easy to macerate 
herbs yeah. and oil. So it is simple. It is really just simple to do something like that. Now and what even, people, why don't people do it more? I guess people just don't like the effort. Why do people order takeaways when they could cook at home? You yeah, know, it's, it's well, it's later. effort, but it's also education. Most people have no yeah. idea that it's so simple. Yeah, or true. it's like, or it's like this is my um, just all over uh, cream lotion that I make. It's quite oh. a thick cream, and I have a, a macerated oil with plantain, which is a a weed in mm. this. And honestly, I mean, you get something like this at the shop, and it's just so, or not the shop, but from a boutique, and it's just so expensive. But mm. it literally cost me just like a few pounds to make. Mm. And that's the other thing. It's all about industry and the mystique and the allure of beauty yeah. and making yeah. everything so look true. official and marketing and selling it to you. Uh-huh. It's the same with food as well. You know, there's that entire industry behind. So we're working against that when we're trying to make our own products. And there's also this uncertainty of, is it safe? Can I really make that? Can I do that mm. in my kitchen? But uh-huh. yes, you can. And that's what I try to try to communicate lovely greens it's really cool is it easy to get hold of the ingredients that you need like how how do you make the cream what what makes the cream in the cream if you know what What makes the cream (laughs) creamy like can you get hold of this stuff easily a cream so a typical lotion or a cream is 70 to 80 percent water Mm -hmm. and then the rest of it is oil so you would have a macerated oil for example so that could be you know 10, 20%. You can have a few added extras in there as well, including essential oil. And then you need a binding agent to emulsify the oil and the water together because as we know, oil and water don't naturally mix. And so you can get specially formulated emulsifiers, which are the safest and the easiest thing to use. And in the past, what people would use was a combination of beeswax and borax as well to create a stable emulsion. And there are other emulsifiers out there as well. But you do and need that. And they're all natural as well, obviously. Some, some are natural. Some mm. are plant-derived. So uh-huh. they're processed in a, in a okay. specific way. But there are so many options out there depending on what you want to use and uh, what your values are and your mm-hmm. price points and all of that. So, so do cool. I want to know if you use all of your own yeah. toiletries that you make? Like, do you have your own beauty regime with all <laughs> that you Well, I mean, not all. No, I buy some things. I, I mean, I've brought some things that I do use. So I, I do use the lemon balm lip balm pretty much every day. I didn't bring my manky one that's in my makeup. <laughs> but I use that because it's just, it's just really conditioning. Mm-hmm. I have, this is my body cream. I don't use this one on my face. This is the one I use on my face. Right. And th- this one is a lot lighter. So it has less of the, the heavier feeling. And I thicken it up using a natural thickener. So it's just very, very light on my skin. And what else do I have here? This is a honey body butter that I use. It's really thick. So mm-hmm. I'll use this on my elbows and knees and things. And then I also have a, a salve. This is a rose geranium salve. Mm. And it's a, it's a little bit lighter than the, the honey body balm. And you just scoop it up and you just use it wherever you need a bit of conditioning. But mm. so not, I do I do buy and use, um, I use micellar uh, water. Is that how okay. you pronounce it even? Mm-hmm. I use that every day as one of my cleansers. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm a big soap maker. So a lot of my, my recipes and, and tutorials online center around making natural soap. And so I do use soap regularly, not every day and definitely not every day on my face. But when I feel that I need a little extra cleansing, I will use handmade soap. And there's other cleansers that I use as well. So there's another cleanser that I make using clay and almond meal and mix together with a bit of honey and some essential oils and lavender. Also very, very easy. And that particular cleanser, it's my own version of a, a Lush product which is just someone, someone, uh, a friend of mine sent me this Lush product, which we couldn't at the time get on the Isle of Man because it needs to be refrigerated. And she asked me, can you come up with a recipe for this? Because it's really great for my sensitive skin. And I looked at it, I'm like, are you kidding? This is so simple. Really? Wow. <laughs> yeah. How cool. I love it too. So I use it. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm going to make some stuff. Lovely wow. green should oh. take on Lush. That's what yeah. I'm thinking. Like. <laughs> you oh could God. totally have a whole chain called Lovely Green. Oh, I'd really like to make in Lush. They have something called R&B, which is like a moisturiser you use on your beard and your hair. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you a picture of it. Maybe make, <laughs> Maybe make me some. <laughs> Obviously, but you know the, the thing is, is is that there is that convenience and there's some really lovely great companies out there making green beauty mm. and there's a lot of different things you can choose from but what i what i want to do is empower people to make their own just mm. just as there are gardeners out there that are trying to empower gardeners to cook more and eat with the seasons and all of that i'm trying to do the same thing but with using plants for other purposes including mm. beauty I think that's really clear, actually, on your socials and with what you do, that, you know, that you are definitely trying to empower people and 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 let people realise that they can grow and make these all themselves. You know, you don't have to go to the shop. You don't have to mm. use chemicals. That's definitely what you're doing. I mean, I love it. Some of the stuff you make is amazing. <laughs> and uh, your soaps, especially. Sorry, I've got something in my eyes. <laughs> like, um, uh, your so- Some of the soaps that you make are... I mean, I can like smell them like uh-huh. <laughs> all this far away. I just think, oh my God, they must smell so Oh, it's yeah. so fun. Smell and it's so them. fun too. And it's the natural colors that I'm I'm really interested in. And you'll see a new post go up this week, a new article on using indigo in naturally uh-huh. coloring soap. And that there's different types of indigo and it's all been very fun experimenting. Wow, well, you grow egg. dye plants as well then, I guess. Some dye plants, the indigo not, it needs a bit warmer of a climate or a polytunnel here, but mm-hmm. other people could. And that's that's the, the beauty of it is just sharing the idea so that even if I can't grow it, something like uh, Alcanet, so Alcanet tinctoria, which doesn't grow here, but I use a lot of, or woad, well, not woad, I can grow woad and do grow woad, but uh, indigo, for example, and sharing that and get more people around the world also excited about these unique and useful plants. Well, that's yeah. so cool. You'd love it at Chelsea Physic Garden. Have you been? I would love to go. I haven't been yet. It was when I when I left London was when I was really starting to get interested in plants and I wasn't quite aware of the Chelsea Physic Garden at the time. But one day when lockdown is well and truly over, I will visit. Yeah, yeah it's definitely worth it. It's beautiful. And I love how they've laid everything out. So you like there's an area where it's poisonous plants, you can medicinal really learn plants. When you're there. Plants yeah. like that have vitamins and you, yeah, you do. And really also um, materials. Have you ever made any plant based materials or is that something you might look at at some stage? You mean like uh, linen and things like that? Yeah, yeah. Because there's a garden at Chelsea Physics that shows you all the oh, different yeah. kind of plant-based materials that can be used. Yeah. yeah. I haven't had a go at it, but you know it's quite interesting because flax, uh, growing flax and creating linen was a big industry here on the island. Okay. And there's just some little information, uh, like little plaques of information around some of our sites here about it, but not very much that is known. I think by current. Oh, wow. Uh, people at Makes National Heritage. So I, I am interested in that. It's all a matter of time doing all of this and learning. It's just can yeah, be a lifelong yeah. obsession. And it's all consuming, isn't it, as well? You know, yes. it takes over everything. <laughs> <laughs> in a good way, though. It's a, it's a good oh, yeah, habit definitely. to form. <laughs> Yeah, when, when someone asks me, what's your hobby? I'm like, well, it's also plants. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, it's a healthy addiction. Yeah. Oh, it's just a healthy definitely. addiction. Oh, so um, also you, you know, obviously you're growing so many different plants for all of these many benefits, but do you cook with them as well? You know, are you into cooking too? Do you? Oh, have- gosh, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Who doesn't I like to eat? going to say, no, I, can't. <laughs> I have toast every night for dinner. <laughs> no, the, um, my, so for example, my allotment garden, it is a mishmash. It's a, um, it's a polyculture of plants that I use for different purposes, including beauty, but also edibles. And it's all mixed together. So you've got different plants, uh, different, say, pollinator friendly plants here and beauty plants here mixed together with all of the edibles and it just works. And I think it's a great design for a small garden, especially if you're interested in useful plants Mm. because you've got the companion planting going on. You have lots of different perennials that you can use for culinary purposes, for beauty, for cleaning your home, all different kinds of things. And then it all benefits the annual crops, the ones that need a bit more molly coddling 
Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I get that. This is so cool. My 10-year-old self would be in love with you and what you do because in those days you're doing all these crazy experiments, but nobody else was doing it. And of course you didn't have the internet to find like-minded yeah. people. Are so, you not in love with her now? Yeah, I still now. Oh, yeah. I am. <laughs> <laughs> So um, you you mentioned, Michael, earlier about this idea of play, and Mm. it is so important. First of all, children, if you are into gardening, to get kids involved, you know, whether it's your own or if you've got nieces or nephews or whatnot, because that small amount of play can get kids interested in gardening. And then even as an adult, the play is so important, too, that connection and that relaxation and that wellness aspect of making and focusing and again, connecting with what you're growing and your growing spaces. Yeah, I can, well, couldn't agree more with that. That's for sure. So if someone was just nice starting out, maybe not necessarily in gardening, but in looking at now using their plants in a different way to they what they have done. So not just for growing, you know, for uh, looking at them or cooking with them and they want to make cosmetics or toiletries. Are there three plants that you could recommend are great to start with? There, you know, most of the skincare plants that we can grow are relatively easy and they're relatively safe to experiment with. I mentioned weeds before. So things like chickweed is great. Mm-hmm. So you can okay. do your weeding yeah. and then use chickweed to make healing anti-inflammatory ointments. But if you're going to specifically grow, I would say grow plants that are going to have multiple purposes so plants that you can use in medicine and cosmetics and are perhaps edible as well. Mm-hmm. And especially if they're edible, you know that they're going to be relatively safe because if you don't yeah. have an allergy to it, when you mm-hmm. eat it, it's unlikely for you to have an allergy to it if you're going to put it on your skin, which mm-hmm. is a concern, I think, if you're trying any new plants is, you know, you might you, your skin might not be, I guess, used to that. Okay. So I would say stick with really easy things, you know, like chamomile. German chamomile is much better than the Roman chamomile if you're going to start out in okay. making beauty products. And then you can also use it for tea, uh, medicinal tea. It's got lots of other purposes. Calendula, which uh-huh. is my big flower that I've been pushing for some years. It's just beautiful. It's sunny. It's nearly always blooming. Yeah. Even throughout the winter months, you'll find a few blooms. And it has a lot of the same properties as chamomile, but is mm-hmm. even easier to grow. Because yeah. it doesn't it doesn't flop over and get untidy like chamomile and the flowers are bigger. You can pick them a lot easier and you can use them in much the same way with making infused oils and then using that oil either directly on your skin or to, to use to make other beauty products. And then the last plant is aloe vera, which mm-hmm. is a house plant. A lot of people are familiar with it already. So if you have a smaller space or you don't have any outdoor space at all that is something that you can successfully grow indoors and one of one beauty product or one well that I make on the go pretty much is aloe vera gel and you can take that fresh from the leaf and just smash it into your the palm of your hand and then put a few drops of oil on top and then if you just rub it together really quickly it creates a kind of a lotion right in front of your eyes. Really? And, oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't Where's know. Where's your aloe vera? <laughs> there's a massive aloe vera in there. In you are not going to rip my aloe vera up. Oh my um, God. Uh, so I read somewhere that, that exactly what you just said aloe vera, olive oil, but also if you put avocado on it, apparently it makes a face mask. Uh-huh, so that's you've cool. got yeah. the. The olive yep. oil in the aloe vera kind of makes this sort of mm-hmm. weird consistency. And then you put the avocado in and it kind of stays on That's your face so as cool. a face mask. Mm. Yeah, well, you can do that as well. Although, you know, when you when you make something like that, you're going to wash it off. And so if you actually have the aloe vera and the oil and you make it is literally it looks like a lotion in your hand when you mm. finish with that. If you don't add the avocado and then you can put it on and it stays on. And aloe vera, when you use it for burns or sunburns, you put it on your skin because it's anti-inflammatory and it helps to cool your skin and to help re- help the skin to regenerate. And it does the same thing with skincare. It, it has that astringent quality that you, if you use it in small amounts, it can really help your skin stay tight and firm and also can help with 
inflammations and redness and things like that. Wow, that's really cool. And you've got most of these remedies in your new book. Tell us all about your new book. Uh, Yes, I have a new book. It's called A Woman's Garden, Grow Beautiful Plants and Make Useful Things. And in it, I have eight chapters. And within those chapters, I go through lots and lots of different categories of useful plants. So there's a chapter for skincare plants. There's a chapter for very beginner medicinal uh, herbs and plants to use. There's a chapter on dye plants. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the plants that I introduce weave throughout the chapters. So you can see that there are lots of plants that have many purposes, which is a big theme in the book. And then the other big theme is that when I was thinking about this book, I was thinking primarily about my garden and what I was growing, but I realized that there are quite a few people out there growing in a similar way to me, although making different products uh, at different uh, artisan goods, growing slightly different plants. And a lot of them are women that I know and have seen on social media or, you know, I follow them. One of them I actually am a customer of. And so what I thought would be fun is to feature the story of each one of these women growers throughout the book. So each chapter begins with an introduction to a different woman gardener who grows a particular type of plant and tells a story of why they grow, what not only what they grow, but why they grow and how they discovered it and why it's important. And the stories are all just so fascinating. And that was one of my favorite parts of writing the book is learning that it's not necessarily just going out there and growing plants specifically for ornamentals or to eat. But there are a million and one reasons why each of us grows. And I hope that that's really inspiring for people who want to try or have a go at trying to grow plants with useful purposes. I do. I think it's great actually adding the stories of other women because I think it gives greater connection and understanding and you just think, oh, wow, you know, that's inspirational. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really lovely. I'm really looking forward to reading it and just learning basically loads. When it eventually comes out, there's been just constant delays with it. And they actually there was a shipment to the UK. So there was the warehouse had books, but apparently they've all sold out with pre-orders. (laughs) <laughs> we're waiting for more to come in right now that's amazing yeah. so it's going to be a very successful book so when is it so. so it's available on pre-order now it's available on pre-order now and currently the release date is in the states it's still april 13th and in the uk it's now may 4th and okay. that's that's because they need to get more books in sure but It'll be out soon, very soon. Oh, very cool. That's very cool. And yeah. where can, if listeners are not already following you, where can they find you online? Just Google Lovely Greens and it'll pop up. I've got a Lovely Greens YouTube channel, website, Instagram and all of that. And I'm, I'm pretty active on each. Cool. Well, we know that you're planning it a year in advance now. So. <laughs> well, that must Amazing. make it so much more achievable as well, you know, having the plan for it, because you are super busy. It keeps you on track, just like your yeah. questions for an interview. It keeps you on track and you don't have to follow it, you know, yeah. all as you the time. We, as you notice, we probably haven't today. Yeah. <laughs> it's been really nice having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for spending time with us and chatting through your lovely lotions and potions. <laughs> And Thank about you. your allotment, and good luck with the book. I'm sure it will be a great success. I can't wait to read it personally, so I'm really looking forward to that. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm. Thanks for being Thank on. you very much, Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. Take care. You too. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, darling. <laughs> Hello, I'm Richard Chivers. I'm an allotment gardener and I'm here to answer any of your allotment or grow your own questions. This question this week has come from Mitch Grows, um, who's uh, on Instagram. And Mitch has asked, do you have a good compost tea recipe or alternatively a natural homemade organic fertilizer for tomatoes? Well, I'm going to say something controversially, Mitch. I don't use any compost teas or any fertilizers. I certainly don't use synthetic fertilizers because I'm an organic gardener, but I don't use anything organic in terms of fertilizers either. And that's because I just use compost or organic matter, which I place on my beds once a year. And the reason for that is that um, it's the, the most sustainable way to create a, 
um, a, a, a living system within your soul. And, and by doing that, this is a short answer, by the way, uh, by doing that, you create a sustainable living system that will feed the plants um, in, a, in, in an efficient and, and natural way. It's how it, how it works in nature. Um, and if you give um, soluble sort of fertilizer, um, you're just giving the plants food and not feeding the soil system. And what you always want to do is create a sustainable system, and that's why I do it that way. However, I would say if you're growing tomatoes in pots, um, they probably would do with a bit of extra. They probably do need a bit of extra fertilizer, um, and a great natural fertilizer is, is is seaweed. If you want to give them some nitrogen, for example, um, but bear in mind they they don't want nitrogen all the time because obviously nitrogen will just encourage them to to give them leaves and when they start to to fruit you want a more balanced organic fertilizer for that um that's basically my answer but if you're growing them in beds don't don't bother with any fertilizer honestly um just just use compost and put compost on top of the bed once a year and let the soil life do the work for you so a question from diary writer on instagram um new to growing out in the open what are the headline pests to look out for uh, what crops must be protected and how pest how best to do that well it really depends on on the the crops you grow in i guess um out in the open one of the most obvious ones if especially in the uk especially if you're in wales like me in the wet wet parts of the uk is obviously slugs um they can be a right nuisance especially for young tender plants when you've just planted them out um ways to dealing with them well, one of the best ways to deal with slugs problem is just don't give them a habitat. Um, they like to live under uh, buckets and pieces of wood and any kind of objects you might leave around your allotment. And they also live in kind of uh, in the grass verges and stuff like that. So if you can keep the habitat down to a minimum, then they'll be less of a problem for you. Um, Going no dig also helps when you just lay a compost on top. They, they don't seem to be as much of a problem if you do that rather than uh, digging. Not sure why that is, but it works for me and I know it works for Charles Darwin as well. Um, other, other pests to consider. Um, one, some of the things you, if you're growing brassicas, so your cabbages, your Brussels sprouts, your kale, uh, two problems with those, um, two pests that you can have. One is uh, cabbage white butterflies. Um, they'll appear in the in the summer and those little white butterflies will land on your brassicas and they will lay eggs and their caterpillars uh, are, the, are the little monkey things that will eat all the leaves um, and the other pest that for brassicas is pigeons or birds but mainly pigeons especially if you live in the in an urban area pigeons will come and munch like hell on your on your brassica and your cabbage leaves and stuff like that so in both cases you really have to use a net there's not really much you can do other than that personally um so try and buy some netting you can get some mesh really fine whole mesh that works really really well if you can prop it up using either uh canes or or, or plastic tubes or anything just to hold it above the plant even better that's probably the best way to to keep pests off your brassicas. Um, more generally speaking, um, everything will have a pest and everything will have a, a cure to the pest as well. And the best way of doing that, uh, if you're growing in your allotment or in your garden, is to create biodiversity um, because everything in balance will keep everything in balance and um, pests will have natural predators. So the best thing you can do is create a biodiverse garden by growing lots of different varieties of vegetables and lots of flowers as well to encourage pollinators and, and, and lots of biodiversity into your, into your garden. That's the best answer I can give you. I had a question from Poppy, Poppy Cloughton from Inst on Instagram. Um, Poppy asked, uh, well she said, my, my purple sprouting broccoli shoots went brown after the snow. What could this mean? Is there anything I can do to recover it? Now, this is an interesting one for me because purple sprouting broccoli is very hardy. So it, you grow, it naturally grows over the winter and it'll grow right through. And you usually harvest your first um, shoots of purple sprouting broccoli in, in early spring. So 
it's very like it's it's less likely to be to do frost damage or, or cold damage. I can't I can't see it being that because it doesn't seem to be a problem. I wonder, and again I'm I'm only guessing, is that if they're turning brown, it might be for some other reason. I could be wrong. It could be the snow has has sat on them too long and and caused them to go brown. Um, but other than that, it could just be that they um, have some kind of bacterial disease or, or, or something like that. I've never come across it before, and I don't seem to have a problem with, with that in when I've grown purple sprouting broccoli. Um, whether, so whether you can recover them, um, I really don't know. It depends if, if they are all infected by it, then it suggests that it probably is maybe a fungal or a bacterial problem. Um, if it's just one or two that got caught by the frost or by the snow, then maybe just pull them off and, and see if you can get the other shoots that come through will be be clear of that. That's an interesting one. I, I don't have a straightforward answer for you, honestly. Um, I'd love to know how it goes there. Welcome to this week's plant-based podcast news. Starting with some sad news this week, Monty Don has had to hold up filming for his new gardening show due to COVID restrictions. The new series will be around Venice, but you'll have to hold your spades a little longer until he can eventually travel again. Also in the news this week... According to the Food Policy Alliance, if you live in Wales, you may not be growing or eating enough vegetables. Hoping that three quarters of each Welsh person's vegetable intake will be grown in Wales by 2030, advice and funding has been given to companies helping towards that goal. You just can't beat growing your own food. And finally... Take part in RHS science research by helping to record your garden pests. Sightings can be submitted to the RHS via their website rhs.org.uk forward slash help our research. Currently, pests on that list include the Berberis sawfly, the cellar slug, Hemerocallis gallmidge, lily beetle, rosemary beetle and the spittlebug. Plus, you can also help to record sweet chestnut habits as part of RHS research as well. Find out more again on the RHS website. Cobra is the very proud partner of Series 4 of the Plant Based Podcast. Joining in the celebration of plants, gardens and outdoor living. With over 60 models of lawnmowers available in the Cobra range, there's something for every garden. As a special offer for our listeners, Cobra is offering the chance to win exclusive prizes. Head over to cobragarden.co.uk to find out more. You can get me a free T-shirt off QVC. Oh, free Danny Minogue. Big fan. No, she's just started. A big fan of the Minogue yeah. sisters. I love the Minogue really? sisters yeah. too. Oh, let's talk about that in the gossip. Well, then. I'm already yeah. recording. Oh. <laughs> Where do you want to start? So basically, Ellen? Michael and Antonia from Norfolk Olive Tree Company are talking about Danny Minogue. Why not? Well, I was just saying I love the Minogue sisters. Do I mean, you? they are super cool. I and mean, I grew up with them on Neighbours. <laughs> Everybody has good But do you like their music? Because Danny had some yeah, great uh, well, dance tracks. Yeah, I want to talk about Kylie. Yeah? You talk about Danny, I talk about okay, Kylie. Cool. Kylie, Man- <laughs> Kylie Minogue's music rocks. And then when she did that thing with Nick Cave, she did a duet with Nick Cave. So oh, she yeah. went. She was, she was dead super in the cool. Night, she? she was super cool. <laughs> they call me the Wild Rose. But my name was Eliza Day. She went this is your from X Factor audition, you know. She went from pop princess to super cool cat, yeah. you know. But that whole album when she did all that alternate stuff around yeah. that time was yeah. really cool stuff. Yeah, she yeah. is cool. And even when she's being a pop princess, mm. she's slick, she's brilliant. Uh, I am a fan. 
but what do you look like? I always look at Kylie and I'm like, I don't know if she has a personality. I'm sorry. Uh, hang what on, do you hang think? on. Her, her, sorry, <laughs> hang on a minute. She always just seems very vanilla. She doesn't give much away. She done no, the locomotion. No, you are wrong. She, Kylie done the locomotion. She has the best personality. Yeah. No. And she did that whole, you know, battling she's cancer. She's yes. No, she's not. And I think... I think that TV and maybe management will try and make her vanilla, but mm. she's not. And also, no. maybe she doesn't want to give it all away. You don't yeah. have to show everyone yeah, I guess everything. We're, we're used you? to no. seeing celebrities <laughs> give it all away, but Danny's got we more are. spice. <laughs> Didn't she pose nude for Playboy once? Yeah, I think yeah. she did, yeah. Good for her if that's what she wants to do. If that's what she we wants to do. We might need to beep out the word nude. <laughs> <laughs> you pose almost nude. Well, we've got, you've got uh, uh, naked gardening. When's naked gardening oh, coming up again? First weekend of May, but I kind of oh, retired soon. from it, you know. Oh, I've really? done a lot of years of it. Yeah. You're not doing it this year. I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. You could come it. here, Michael. Amongst but the do you know what? Trees. I have to say, like, when we were first doing naked gardening and grubby gardeners, this was like, we were really ahead of the curve yeah, because were. now you just don't open Instagram and Facebook and saw yeah. boys with plants and it's yeah, like yeah, yeah, and it's all yeah. a bit passe now so that's why I'm out of it you know I think I'd <laughs> and like, also I'm fat no <laughs> I'd like to think of it as that you started something yeah. actually you were the fire starter and it's true at first there was a few of you doing it and now yeah. it's taken on but I think that's great I think be proud oh, of that oh it's really cool yeah and how it's helping people body confident you know be confident about the sexuality as well it's yeah, really it it's really cool, cool yeah Get it out. Get it out with your plants. Get it out. So I think we should just tell our listeners, kind of set the scene where we are. All right. Don't you think? So we're at Norfolk Olive Tree Company, and we are sitting amongst some absolutely beautiful olives, and the sun is shining, there's blue sky. We could potentially be in the med here. Where's we my could. tapas? I know, where's <laughs> our tapas? Tapas and red wine. But it's very beautiful. So oh, where are you I actually based, bread. Antonio? Bread with tomato for Spanish bread. Oh, f- oh. oh. Pa- Pan con tomate. Yeah. That's my favourite thing, pan con tomate. So simple. Well, we, Can we talk are... talk about Spanish food in a minute, please? Yeah, yeah we'll go back. We'll <laughs> salivate. Yeah. So we're now... Um, we've left our shop in the heart of Norwich, and we're now on the Coleman Estate, which is great for Paul, because it's like coming home, because he grew up on the Coleman Estate, because his father was the gamekeeper here. Cool. So he's in heaven. He's come home. Yeah. And now a lot of their land is being um, reappropriated so there's not so much farming going on so businesses can move in so they've got um, plenty of different businesses and I think they're going to build some artist studios here as well wow. so we're just on the outskirts of Norwich we're now open by appointment which is great but we're, we're back onto ancient meadowlands so the meadows behind us um, they've done data and they've done archaeological digs and they've got sort of medieval they've come up with medieval artifacts and things wow, it's absolutely cool. beautiful so it's a really cool. lovely spot i need a photo of an ancient meadow yeah we'll, we'll get to the ancient yeah, meadow it's really beautiful yeah. they're oh, called wow. hollows and it's i think instead of roads they were called hollows and you can see in the land where the land dips and creates this hollow wow they should make a film about that on netflix they make a film about everything Every on sort of hole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the dig. Yeah. I loved that. I loved so that. So you love being here? I love being here. It's incredibly windy, um, as you can probably hear in amongst the um, Australis. They're being b- bished and bashed, and the sable palms are being bished and bashed. Um, but everything is thriving here and I suppose it's been a bit of an experiment if it doesn't thrive in this kind of conditions then mm. we won't carry on you yeah. know, it all looks them like it's them. surviving to me it looks yeah. like it's thriving actually which is remarkable given that they're Mediterranean plants that a lot of people don't imagine you can grow in English gardens but many of them you know? will be on hills yeah. and also along coastal areas yeah, where yeah. it will be windy won't true, they true. well also they're a fruit tree and as we know, or may not know, but fruit trees do require cold weather to flower and set fruit. So cold weather is really important. Yeah. yeah. And as you say, they're grown on hillsides, they're grown in really exposed mm-hmm. parts of the world. And if you touch their leaves, they're really small and leathery, which yeah. means that they're, they're incredibly, yeah, they're, yeah, and they're wind resistant as well. 
I I'm always think there's something magical about olive trees. Yeah. I just they've got the like a story to tell. To them. Yeah, yeah, and their age, like they've seen so much and been through yeah. so much. They're kind of mystical. I love them. I mean, that's why sort of painters have become been obsessed with them. You know, Van Gogh. I think was it sort of 35 paintings mm -hmm. he painted of olive trees. Wow. Cezanne, a Renoir. You know, they were all obsessed with olive trees. Writers. Um, that's cool. So also, I really want to set the scene that we're at the end of like a walkway and it's lined with yeah. olive trees and at the end is a really old barn. And it is just so beautiful. It's like you are a million miles away. <laughs> and actually the other end is Strelitzia as well, Bird of Paradise, in which flower. is also flowering. Yeah, so it's really cool. And we're in and we're in Norfolk. Oh. We are in Norfolk, I know. <laughs> That's I awesome. My secretaires, oh, no, no, no. It's still artful. Yeah, it is. It's still a dead artful. flower on a bird of paradise, but it still looks amazing. It does. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And again, the um, bird of paradise, they represent liberty, I think. Yeah. Yeah, they represent liberty. Right. And they're incredibly, I mean, nature and art have got so much, you know, they've got such a great, rich relationship. Mm. Artists have always been inspired by nature. And they're just so. T they're really tactile. Don't yeah. rip it. <laughs> oh, no. Can we talk about Spanish food yet? Please? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Bank on the mat. Oh. Come on then. I made, I got obsessed recently with making a, I'm not sure how you say it, but fideo. Fideo. Okay. Which yeah. is like paella with um, like this little short pasta, which is like vermicelli. Oh my God. And it's just delicious with alioli and it's just, oh my God. I love it's alioli. Oh, oh. I love Spanish food. I mean, I'm not really missing. And when you get the crispy bottom as well. Well, that's know. the best yeah. thing. They say you have to have the crispy Definitely. bottom. You've got to get the bottom of your pan Soccerat. burnt yeah. through. Just the same yeah. with paella. You're not allowed to stir. You yeah. let it sit. Definitely. And then the prized bit of paella is the crispy bit at the yeah. end. Yeah. That's, that's cool. But yeah, I'm missing our business trips. Yeah. Of course, because um, of COVID, you haven't been able to go overseas. Where would you go to get them then? We go to Catalonia and. So that's quite a drive then. No, we, we used to fly, but oh, obviously oh, during COVID, choose. we've been uh -huh. doing business via WhatsApp, you know, yeah. like the rest of the world, sort of Zoom and WhatsApp. So you've been most... choosing your olive trees yeah. via WhatsApp? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go, no, not that one. Yeah, that one. No, not that I one. Guess what can, about the one behind yeah. you? You can. But I mean, what do you yeah. think about when COVID is over and you can travel again? Oh. Will you use WhatsApp more or will you still fly over to Sydney? I will fly over. I will fly because over. Because it's about the extra conversations, the extra connection. Absolutely. Also, the... Uh, what is it? The thing that I miss of it is, like, not having the creative energy of yeah. being in a different place or talking yeah, to a different 100%. person. Yeah, 100%. I just saw a butterfly. Sorry. A but there, here we are. Look, look, look. <laughs> Oh, make a wish. Oh, first butterfly of the year, oh. maybe. How beautiful. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's like slight interlude. <laughs> so. Oh, listen to the birdies. And listen to the road in the distance, the Never farming equipment. We ignore that. <laughs> but I think, you know, for, for when clients come here for buy appointment, they always come, and this is the same for when we go shopping, they'll come here looking for, say, two gnarly olive trees. Mm -hmm. And that's what they come for. But they'll leave with something completely different yeah. because they've seen something that's spoken to them that has yeah. literally caught their eye. <laughs> and that's the same for us when we go and select things is you kind of, we go with the best intentions and a list of what we're yeah. going to bring back. But then you always spot something else. So, and that you don't get in the world of WhatsApp or Zoom. No, so, true, no. yeah. so I do miss, I miss that. Um, it will yeah. come. I guess it just means like, yeah, if you in if in future you can't get there for any reason, you can deal with it another yeah. way. And before we wouldn't have had that option. We yeah. would like I said to you earlier, I've done loads of like seminars online for businesses, but never would have done that yeah, in twenty nineteen. Yeah. Diversification. Yeah. Some of the stuff that's happened is amazing. Yeah. It's really progressive. But what about Brexit? Yeah. Oh well Brexit um, has been terrible as predicted that it would be. Um, when you're importing, I mean, I can get my head around customs and excise. I mean, everyone will have to be prepared for things going up. You have to pay a customs agent, then you've got your VAT later on, which you never had to pay before. So, I mean, customers will see plants go up quite a lot, I would say by at least 20%. Wow. But more than that, I mean, that I was kind of prepared for. I think more than that is is the rules and regulations you know the UK was desperate to escape EU bureaucracy 
And all that has happened is there's, they've created their own bureaucracy on a very old and wieldy um, computer system. <laughs> So you have to make all these declarations and you can only make a declaration if you've got um, Internet Explorer 11. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. But yeah. And so all I'm nice. I spoke to the help lady and I said, surely you could have got the people to design the um, software who designed Pinterest or, <laughs> or Instagram. Because I was I was literally losing it on the phone. Because you have to make a declaration. <laughs> The day before your plants arriving in the UK, otherwise DEFRA can either destroy your plants or turn them back and send them back. Insane. And of course, you have to pay for everything in advance now because everyone's so worried. There's no sort of oh, we'll send it to you and you'll pay. You know, have to. The truck wants the money in advance, so so much can go wrong. And you're supposed to do this kind of 20-page declaration on um, the government website. That's mad. And it's so old-fashioned. So lots of people are just stopping bringing stuff over. You know, they're just... And so that will affect the horticulture industry yeah. a great deal. I mean, my husband's doing a garden design at the moment and build service for a client, and it's a really big project. And obviously some of our stuff is going into that garden design, but other stuff he's been having to source himself from, you know, local um, su suppliers who grow their own stuff, but also import. And they just said there is, they're not taking on any new clients, you know. If you haven't already, if you're a landscape designer and you haven't already got a good relationship with a local mm. nursery, you're, you know, you're in trouble. And from a consumer point of view, there's just less choice or smaller sizes of everything. And this is at a time where horticulture industry has seen a massive increase yeah. in yeah. people interested in gardening and outdoors. So you wonder what will happen over the next yeah, year. Yeah, it's going to be really tricky. Mm. It's going to be really tricky. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And scary. And mm. scary. I mean, I know it will force people to perhaps use local suppliers and local But growers. the local suppliers... But it's not all about local, is it? Yeah, yeah. But they can't cope. Yeah. They're not, they, can't, they, can't, they can't grow <laughs> enough. And you can't get the type of thing, surely, as well. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's only so yeah. much that will grow. And there are, are only going to be small plants. And then if you have a terrible winter mm. and gales... I mean, we've lost <coughs> our polytunnel, so everything we were growing is, you know... Mm. You can have a sort of frostbitten now. Oh, yeah. will they survive? Yeah, they will, but they kind of look a bit bruised and battered. Mm. So you can't really sell them because the consumer wants everything to look shiny mm. and bright. <laughs> you can't sell, you know, an agave <coughs> with a bit of a bruising in it. I mean, you can to a true gardener. Yeah. They'll know, but someone who's just seen a picture of something and goes, oh, I want that, they won't. Mm. They won't understand that new growth will come through when you can clip the old growth off. I just have to want to add in here that you ha you are a performer, or you have been a performer, because every now and again you every break into song. Every <laughs> <it's a> song. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I it. Well, I was, I was a performer. Um, I was in the Can Can, and then I used to do French chansons, sort of Edith Piaf tributes uh -huh. and things like that. Yeah. So... You could can can your way do, down here. Yes. Yeah. I don't think I'd get my leg up very high, to be fair. <laughs> but um, no, I do sing. I do enjoy singing to it. See? Break into song you again. You wanted to. Oh, dear. Oh, my gosh. Um, I thought everyone did it. I just thought that that's what people no, do. No, no, that's just you. <laughs> Mind you, it's a good tick to have. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's original. Oh, it is original. Big dog. <laughs> <laughs> what are you were they carrying on? That's such a funny moment. Ella just like was expecting me to say something next, so she just put the microphone in front of me. I was just like, what? I thought you were really going to say I got nothing to say. You've got nothing to say. When do you have nothing to say? I've got to just say, you look fetching in your leather today. Oh, thank yeah, you. No, I, like I the, dug it out look. yesterday, yeah. Yeah, and a roll neck as well. Yeah, I you look looking very... very <laughs> you look rich. I mean, the weather is going to improve. I think you are going to have to get rid of the polo neck, and I'm going to yeah. get rid of my fur line. Oh, you've wearing got fur line. Oh, yeah. oh, my gosh, they look so fur warm. Line, but it's that awkward to... weather at the moment. It when is. You're, what you do you wear? You don't want to wear a winter coat. You don't want to, like, wear nothing. So what are you going to do? It's... 
anoraks all the way. <laughs> <laughs> we are meant to have a lovely couple of days We're here. We've got to layers. Yeah. My husband said to me this morning, I said, what should I wear? What should I wear? He said, layers, layers, layers. <laughs> My husband says the same thing yeah. always about mm. the layers because then you can just take off as many as you want. Take, take Why off. Where the dog go? Well, I hate taking stuff There's a little off. doggy here called Polly as well. Polly. 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 Oh, here she is. Polly Pocket. Oh, she's the <laughs> cutest little she's thing. She's so sweet. I love Hello, the way Polly. dogs like that walk. I know. It's kind of plod. It's like... Blah, 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 blah. What breed is Polly? She's her... Holly. Holly? She's what, half, I thought it was Polly. I thought she's Sorry, half Polly. border, half Shih Tzu, so we call her a Shih Terrier. <laughs> <laughs> Need to bleep that out, oh, darling. Do you? Yeah, <laughs> no. Do you? Funny. No, it's a cake. Oh, gorgeous. Because the Shih Tzus are designed to look like lions, and you can look at her, and she is certainly a bit of lion. In her. <laughs> I don't think she lion. has any lion's blood, though. No, she's not lion's <laughs> blood. She's a border terrier, and her mum's at home who's too old to come to work because she's blind and deaf, and will just oh, wander no. off, and you can't oh, find her. So, but she's come my little shadow and she loves it follows you around everywhere what a lovely place to be for a little doggy yeah Cute little dolly so the sun dolly holly holly <laughs> the sun's gone in in usual uk style oh. do you think that's our cue <laughs> the yeah. sun's gone in let's end the gossip it might be <laughs> i want to go and see that ancient meadow <laughs> yeah let's, go, let's, let's go and see it yeah um, Antonia, thank you so much for gossiping with us today. Oh, you know me, I love gossip. <laughs> You've got to wait for the uncut version. <laughs> yeah, wait for the uncut. <laughs> Have a lovely day. And sure. you. <laughs> thank you, bye. <laughs> The music for the Plum Face podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James. And our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi Echo. Mm-hmm.